Welcome, 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 everyone, on this wintry day, at least in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, welcome to our digital summit organized by the Global Landscapes Forum, GLF. Um, this one is entirely prepared and presented to you by our Youth and Landscapes uh, Initiative. Um, this is our sixth digital summit. These online digital summits, which might be webinars or online meetings or online learning events, are organized together with the GLF partners. Um, either to follow up on past conferences, run up towards new conferences, or simply to elaborate on issues which are active and alive in our larger GLF community. The purpose is to bring the GLF community tighter together beyond merely the physical e events that we organize. Through online summits, we aim to keep the conversations and discussions going throughout the year. My name is Peter Cazier. I work in the GLF communications team, and I have the honor to provide the technical support to this digital summit today. During this digital summit, the man behind the scene is Khalid Walji, who will be monitoring your questions and feedback in the chat box. Khalil is a recent graduate from the University of British Columbia and currently an intern at FAO in Rome, where he works with the social forestry team with a focus on forest education. Khalil is also, as many of you in our audience are, an active member of IFSA, the International Forestry Students Association. But before we start a word on the logistics of this uh, digital summit, we're all connected through a service called BlueJeans, which allows uh, everyone to see the speakers with a webcam. Feedback, tips, and questions from you, the audience, should only be done via the chat box. So as a participant, please keep your video and audio muted and keep it muted throughout the whole session. Otherwise, it will suck up a lot of bandwidth from everyone. Even though, as usual, we are with a really big group, we had over 140 registrations for the uh, digital summit, I would still like uh, to have this session as interactive as possible. So to encourage this, we will not have any PowerPoint presentations today. We will dive straight into the interactive discussions really fast. So I do encourage you to send remarks, suggestions, and questions as of now using the chat box, the icon which you can find on the top right-hand side of your window. Um, your feedback questions uh, is really what makes this digital summit interactive. So when you have a question or suggestion that pops up in your mind, just type it right in. Halil will be monitoring the questions. After this digital summit, we will send you a mail with a link to the recording of this digital summit um, and some links maybe of uh, resources or websites that we might have mentioned uh, during this webinar. Um, or some answers to questions which we could not um, uh, tackle during the digital summit itself. But to introduce the topic of today uh, and to give you a run through through the program, and moderate the discussion, allow me to introduce our today's Master of Ceremony who pulled this digital summit together, Serena Abraham. Serena is a passionate advocate um, for youth involvement in solutions for landscapes challenges. She is currently the youth coordinator for the Global Landscapes Forum. As well as president of the um, International Forestry Students Association, she is also a alumni and coordinator of the Youth and Landscapes Initiative a partnership of different youth organizations and young people committed to the landscape's philosophy. Serena studied uh, environmental science and economics at the University of Washington. Serena, please unmute and go ahead. The floor is yours. All right, thank you, Peter. And thanks everyone for joining. I'm really excited to have this conversation. Um, it's gonna be a great one, but I wanna start off talking about why we're having this digital summit. So the Global Landscape Forum is seeking to build a movement of 1 billion people rallying around sustainable landscapes. The reason we're hosting this digital summit today is because of the reality that no substantial movement has ever existed without young people. In fact, I would say young people tend to be at the heart of societal movements, of revolutions. They're at the forefront of changing behaviors and perceptions, and they play a key role in the evolution of cultural and societal norms. So we know when it comes to building a movement of individuals seeking to make positive, long-lasting change to the world, we need to bring young people into the conversation and we need to empower them to be devoted actors. In particular, when we're looking at long-term goals of 2020, 2030 and beyond. 
But today's conversation is not about convincing people that, that youth are important. It's unpacking how we can meaningfully integrate youth. How do we connect the millions of inspired young people with ideas about affecting positive change who haven't had a chance to try them out? How do we amplify the concerns and perceptions of this generation? How do we not only invite but include youth in the planning of regional um, and national initiatives on the ground? So there's so many questions involved in youth inclusion and youth integration, and it all boils down to how. How do we go from this vague, fuzzy concept that sounds so good and is all too easy to say, let's include youth, to implementing programs and strategies that realize youth integration successfully? So it is a big question, but I have an excellent group of speakers who come from varying organizations and fields. So agriculture, forestry, restoration, um, and they're all hopefully going to bring a little piece of this answer. So at least we'll get this conversation started. It might take a few digital summits, but we'll get there. So it's at this time that I'd like to invite our speakers to unmute, um, turn on their video so we can see you, and to introduce yourselves. So please share who you are, your experience in youth programs, your organizational affiliation, and for fun, uh, I want to know what your favorite morning drink is, tea or coffee. So Courtney, can we start with you? Sure, hi everybody. My name is uh, Courtney Paisley and I'm the director of YPAR, which is Young Professionals for Agricultural Development. YPART is a global network supporting young people in the agricultural sector. We have about 15,000 members registered worldwide, but about 35,000 on our Facebook groups and, and a lot more through our social media channels. So YPART is a network about, it does a lot of online activities in terms of looking at the image of agriculture among young people, sharing good stories. Um, we do a lot of uh, activities related to research and mentoring, but we also have a huge population of young people on the ground with 80 national chapters, which I think is our most exciting aspect, and which I'll be talking about a little bit later. So um, my favorite morning drink, well, I live in Italy, so it's the land of coffee. So uh, definitely a few of those on the day. All right, Selena. Nice. All right, next up, Paula. Hi, I am very happy with this huge turnout. Congratulations, Selena and everyone. Um, hello, world. So, good evening from Bangkok, Thailand. I am Maria Paula Sarigumba. I'm uh, from the Philippines and I'm a forester. In the recent past, um, from a, for a year, I've, 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 uh, I'm the head of the Professional Develop Com Development Commission of the International Forestry Students Association. And currently, I work as a junior consultant in the Food and Agriculture Organization here in um, the regional office for Asia and the Pacific. Um, part of my work is to mainstream youth uh, in the heart of the work of FAO, which is agriculture, fisheries, and forestry. And I am very passionate about youth, about the struggles of the youth sector. So I am interested to know how the future of forest work uh, and, the, and the future of uh, communities in, in the changing dynamics in landscapes and also how we can how we can better include um, youth in pl planning processes and also how to capture their visions for the future. Thanks. Morning drink. Coffee or tea? Coffee. Okay. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, Daniel. All right, hello. Welcome, everyone. It is quite a big turnout. My name is Daniel Bernke. I am a junior professional officer at the UFRO headquarters in Vienna. For you who don't know what that is, that's the International Union of Forest Research Organizations. I'm coordinating the UFRO EFI Young Scientists Initiative. Now, this is a collaboration between UFRO and the European Forest Institute. So I'll speak a little bit more about that, but um, I also have some experience with IFSA, and I hope that we can talk about some of these experiences because our initiative is in its infancy, and I think where I may not be able to contribute much to the problems and pitfalls of these types of initiatives, I plan on learning something that could help us in the near future. And I'm afraid I'll have to jump on the coffee bandwagon on this one. 
Hey, thanks, Daniel. Um, we, I see Ms. Oazian Arena has just hopped on. Can we hear from you? I think you're muted, so we can't hear you at the moment. Um, all right, let's try to see. Um, okay, I unmuted yeah, her. Um, Honorin, go ahead. Can you hear me now? Yes, go ahead. Yes, welcome. Okay. So thank you so much for the warm welcome. And uh, if it is the introduction, I am Miss Wasi Bonori, and um, I am Miss Earth Rwanda 2017 and Miss Popularity Rwanda 2017, as well as Miss Social Media 20, Rwanda 2017. But also currently I'm working with the IUCN as a maternal leave um, ambassador, just trying to see how we can integrate the youth in this uh, um, uh, forest and landscape restoration activities and everything. So we've been doing, um, quite a good number of things that I hope that we're going to share um, throughout this, this uh, incredible discussion. Thank you. Perfect. And I had also asked everyone to share whether they prefer coffee or tea in the morning. <laughs> uh, tea is good. <laughs> tea. Wow, so perfect yes. diversity. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Um, can I Thank have you. our last speaker, I think, Adrego, could you introduce yourself? And, and in that process, you will have to learn how to unmute. Yeah, you're online now. Go ahead. You're good. We can hear you. Yeah, hello. <laughs> Hi, we can see your feet, but if you can turn it around, then we can see your face. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Here, don't mind me. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, my name is AJ Guaganovo from Nigeria. I'm a medical laboratory scientist by profession, but I have strong interest in agriculture and also mainstreaming youth into sustainable agriculture to address problems with um, food insecurity. On this platform, I'm representing CSAY, and that's Climate Smart Agriculture Youth Network globally. Um, we have presence in about 30 countries, precisely more in Africa and few in um, the European countries. Um, for now, I think that's all for now. That's all for now. Coffee or tea? Tea. Ah, okay, perfect. I feel like a flight attendant. Um, thank you, everyone. <laughs> There's a really diverse group of people, and I hope that our participants will all feel like a little piece of their interest is, is here in our, in our speakers. Um, for myself, I have tea first and coffee second, so I don't have to pick in the morning. Um, all right, so I did want to also emphasize one important thing to note. Um, the best discussions are those that pull on collective experience. Um, so this is not just our speakers, but our participants. So I invite all of you who are attending, please chime in at any time. Um, you want to alter the direction of this conversation, you have an experience. Um, let us know. This includes my co-moderator, Kalil, and our webinar guru, Peter, as well. Um, and I will emphasize, please, only in the chat box. So let's get started. Um, we're tackling this question by going through four parts. Um, so if you look at this digital summit, it's titled Youth Mainstreaming, The Good, The Best, and The Ugly. And that kind of follows our structure here. We're starting with part one, which is the good. And the question there is why? we're hoping to answer why should we include youth, get some concrete benefits and advantages, and then we're moving into how. You're gonna hear some best practices from our speakers, and then we'll go into the common pitfalls, which is the ugly, uh, which is gonna be my favorite, but I will wait until we get there. So let's start with part one, which is why. I'd like our speakers to share with us some advantages of including youth. Um, and the reason we're having this conversation is because why an organization chooses to include youth, um, what program they they intend, um, they, they develop or create as the vehicle for including youth. So it's important for us to define why from a comprehensive standpoint, an aspirational standpoint, and then also why from the business case. So when you start working for an organization, what are the direct benefits that you can get from including youth um, in the work that you do? So I've gone ahead and asked each speaker to share with us one to two or um, three advantages in both categories. 
So can I have Daniel start? Okay, thank you. Um, so as you know, UFRO and IFSA have very close collaboration when it comes to youth. And on the other end of that spectrum is the special program for development of capacities that UFRO runs, which targets researchers in, um, in what, developing nations. But there's a deficit in between there. So where the UFRO and IFSA collaborations for the youth and the students, uh, they're very successful. I mean, the Joint Task Force on Education is, is a good example. It's just a bit of a lack. There's a gap in support for students or, or mid-career scientists. You know, the, the, the recent graduates who are just starting their careers and they don't qualify for any of these, you know, any of these benefits. So that's why we're starting this Young Scientist Initiative. And our goal in this whole thing is to train leaders and scientists because we, we're facing some very unique problems in the future and we need, we need our leaders and our scientists to be able to tackle them. And part of this program is networking and building research capacity and collaboration between our organizations so that we can address these problems properly. And of course, what UFRA does is we, we share knowledge. And that's what, we, that's what we're trying to do here. And I think that, that says that our, our take on everything here, it's a big advantage to, to include the youth and not only students in, in these kinds of initiatives and offer them support. Perfect. That's actually, as I was, before this webinar, I was making a list of things and that was not on my list. So it's great to hear this already building into a longer list. Um, Paula, do you want to go next? Hi, yeah. For, for the aspirational comprehensive standpoint, um, I think the challenges that we face today in terms of the environment, it gets more and more complex and it's hard to teach old dog new tricks. So landscapes management is not easy and um, it's not, we need a lot of capacity building just to grasp the concept. And also um, it takes a lot of barriers to, that we need to break for it to be implemented. So I guess the youth is, is a good investment in terms of making this a, a success, making this approach um, uh, successful in terms of our initiatives and landscapes approach and in making, more, in making societies more resilient because um, a big chunk of the population is um, is the youth, so I think, and, and, and they are the most vulnerable sector also. So it, 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 I guess in investing more in youth is making more societies more resilient. And it's important to, to highlight the youth in, in terms of that, in processes, in planning, in, 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 as part of the bigger landscape. In terms of, of the business case, of course, we recruit youth because it provides energy, creativity, and the relentless support to an organization. And the youth are highly adept, usually are highly adept to social media and new technologies. As we can see now, we have a big turnout in this um, webinar. So it's, it's, a, it's a manifestation that we are into, into, we can ride the technological wave. And somehow it also provides a good portfolio to an organization if they hire youth. It includes the diversity, it, it's, it is uh, addresses inclusion in, in, in their workflow, in their workforce. But removing as, as part of the objective of this uh, webinar, we remove the ro rose colored glasses, but because most of the time the youth are, are seen as cheap labor. And some young professionals I know are taken advantage with uh, uh, because of uh, overwork and underpaid scheme. And most young professional professionals don't have families yet. So if you provide more time, more services to an organization in a very cheap price. I hate to say this, but they get the most value out of a, out of a youth if they're part of the workforce. That's it. I love it. Thanks, Paula. Uh, one thing I did ask our speakers to do is be um, not politically correct. So we'll hope to get that as we go through. Um, Ejegu, could you want to go next? We can hear you. 
Hello? Yeah. yeah. Uh, my organization, yeah, my organization, Climate Smart Agriculture Youth Network, is actually an organization, an online organization. So, practically, it was um, vetted so we could reach out to youth because um, in this um, dispensation where we have been rising um, youth population and um, so far so good um, in history, we now know that um, the world is having a large population of youths and the only way we can um, effect the change we want, so we thought the engaging youth through the online platform would um, be a very successful way of um, getting to the youth, most especially when we talk about the issue of agriculture. So my organization actually aims to, you know, equip youths with information. That is to say, we help to redefine youth perspective about agriculture. That's um, and also we empower them with um, the necessary requisites. We give mention and all of that. So, practically speaking, on the business angle, we we mentor youths in um, different aspects of um, agriculture, which they feel it's um, important or it's of interest to them. And um, so far, so good. We thus act as an intermediary between um, potential donors, for example, IFAD and the the youth. So, I think through this um, intermediary phase of Climate Smart Agriculture Youth Network. Um, a lot of youth can get informed about um, the possible changes in climate change, how they can um, practically um, get engaged in agriculture and um, increase um, food um, productivity, bearing in mind that um, food insecurity, it's a major challenge with um, um, African countries, most especially, and um, some European countries. I think that's what we do for now currently. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I think lastly, Courtney. Um, thanks. So, uh, yeah, I see the aspirational comprehensive portion linking a lot with the business case. So I think I'll just put the two together because I, I have a hard time differentiating them. Uh, but the first one is, uh, and was mentioned already by Paulo, is uh, inclusivity. So I think in, we obviously have to include different sectors of society, which is a nice thing, but it also makes good business sense. So if you are developing a program or if you're developing a service, um, you don't want to ignore a large part of the population because your success depends on uh, everyone within that population, not a certain segment. So I think- oh, that's really cool. um, Yeah, so that's the first one. Uh, the second one is to pass on expertise and knowledge. So again, that's through a lot of, um, you know, we've heard a little bit about mentoring already, but an organization or um, develops a lot of expertise, develops a lot of experience, and those people, as they retire or as they move out of the operation, um, they need a, to pass that on. And I think the best way is by bringing in young people in order to to gain that knowledge so that it's not lost. Um, so I think that makes good business sense as well. And then the last one is just buy-in for the next generation. So if you are developing a program and you want this to have a long lifetime and you want it to be sustainable, the only real way that you're able to do that is by engaging young people within that process, within the program, you know, making sure that they're that they buy in, but also making sure that their vision is uh, is is a part of that, is a component of that. Because if you want them to actually bring that through and and see it through, then they obviously have to believe in it as well. So I think sustainability is just a very clear part of uh, why you should engage with young people. Thanks, um, and thanks for blending those two together because it it does suck to have them differently, and it it actually is um, the way we should see it is it together and not not it separate. Um, and actually, lastly, can I have Ms. Honoré? You are muted. All right, you're on. Yeah. <laughs> I came back. Thank you so much. And um, my response on this is that I would just give maybe some four points. That 80% talking about uh, the run experience, 80% of population is the youth. And talking about East Africa, it is still the youth which is dominating. And projecting to 2050, still the youth will keep on dominating in every sphere, I mean, in every corner of this world. So including them, it's just preparing them to get ready to capture their inheritance. Because at the end of the time, it's not about us who are living. It's uh, them who will be living tomorrow. It's, it's us who will be inheriting still this land. So including this um, dominating population is preparing for the next uh, generation as uh, my colleague um, Kultini has said. 
the next point I would say is that uh, imagine just a body without bones, how would it be? So a country without the youth, an organization without the youth. So including the youth, it means you're bringing strength, new energy in the organization, in the country. And uh, the third one is that um, I believe that both the mentor and the mentee, we are all seeking the opportunity to mentor, to inspire and to empower whoever we are mentoring or whoever is mentoring us. So I believe that including the youth is an opportunity, a very good opportunity to empower and inspire and also mentor someone. Yeah, because uh, one thing that we are lacking nowadays is just uh, we are lacking jobs or maybe um, the doors are closed because uh, the, 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 this song is keeping on going on. Uh, the youth is an experience. The youth is an experience. But then if you're giving an opportunity to mentor, inspire and empower, then that in, in an experience song will get over. Thank you. Thank you, um, and thank you to all my speakers for that. But we're already getting some very interesting questions in the in the chat box. Um, but what I want to do first, before we get to those questions, is is hear from our speakers and their thoughts on best practices. And then I know all of us are well equipped with critical think thinking skills, and we can dive in and really um, identify where these pitfalls are and where they, where these boxes are. So, um, is there anyone who'd like to go first? Wave your hand. I know there's someone in there. With... No, Daniel, okay, you're next. Please let us know. Um, and I think you're a good person to start because this is a new initiative. So um, it'd be great to hear about the IUFRO EFI Young Scientists Initiative. Okay, so let me first just tell you a little bit about it. I could also post a link in the chat box. So like I said, we're trying to close that gap between students support and senior researcher support. So what we are doing is as of next year, we are going to take five early career scientists from Africa, Asia and Latin America. We are going to put them with a host organization under the mentorship of an experienced researcher in Europe and they will conduct a short scientific visit. So it doesn't necessarily mean the pub a publication will, will come of it, but it will yield something of scientific value. But the focus is more on training the young scientists and also creating a link between the two organizations. Now this isn't limited to member organizations of UFRO or EFI, because that would defy the point of creating this network. So anyone who works at a at a forest related research organization in Africa, Asia or Latin America who holds an MSc or higher and is what is under 35 years of age or 35 or under will consider a good application from them. So uh, where it comes to the best practices. So now we know of a lot of similar things where you know the there might be some money for them, you know, to send the guys wherever they want, but they they lack leadership or proper mentorship. It's like this this young researcher or student gets dumped in some foreign country and there's actually no specific guidelines on what they are supposed to do. So what we are doing is we want the applicant to take the initiative and draw up a good research proposal, have the proposed mentor sign off on it and approve it and we think that with the proper guidance with our guidance and the guidance of the mentor and the host organization we can get a lot more out of a short scientific visit than something like an internship and where you guys were talking I saw in the chats there someone mentioned you know they're they're advertising unpaid internships now that's not very attractive I'm afraid I I wouldn't do that. I know a lot of people think that they have to get experience that way, um, but yeah, it's sort of exploiting the youth a little bit, and maybe they don't actually gain all that much, much experience. I have done that kind of internship before, and yeah, I kind of wish I hadn't. Um, but I think yes, with with proper guidance, 
that's that's the way forward. We need to we need to teach these okay youngsters. I'm a youngster. You know, we all need guidance, but these kind of initiatives are definitely the way forward. We need them, and we hope that we'll get more support and more applications out of this. Thank you, and thanks for touching on that point on on uh, unpaid internships. It was one of the questions we were going to get to. Um, but yeah, thank you. Great to hear that this is a new initiative and one that was just launched a few months ago. Um, and I think it does address a critical gap. Um, let's see. Paula, how about you? I feel like I'm in a recitation. <laughs> okay, so um, we in FAO, we recognize that young people often experience marginalization as a result of the severe problems such as poverty, hunger, discrimination, displacement, and lack of education and opportunities. And most of the time, youth do not have access to productive assets such as land, financial systems, and not to mention that they are often neg neglected in policy processes. I think I've said that earlier. And in the rural areas, um, young people have a more disadvantaged position. They have less opportunities and investments, and they, they are not able to, to access facilities, and they are more vulnerable to disasters and climate change impacts. So here in FAO Asia Pacific Regional Office, we have a small youth project to stimulate innovation and creativity of youth um, through competition of uh, sustainable projects. So the youth sit together, they design sustainable projects for, for agriculture, forestry, and fisheries. Um, this, is, this aims to capture how they want to approach um, uh, sustainable agri agriculture and forestry. And we also provide learning experience so, to, to the youth. So they are, they are um, gathered for a field excursion to visit FAO projects on the field to firsthand um, experience and learn from, from, from the different um, approaches that FAO uh, promotes on the ground. This project is implemented in Philippines, Vietnam, and uh, um, Nepal. Uh, and I was very amazed how this very small investment, very small youth project, has translated to a lot of, of uh, very innovative uh, designs from the youth, from circular farming to husbandry, uh, seed to table approaches, and there are some that they want to supply nutrition um, inputs or, or their inputs to the nutrition program of the school. So I, I'm, I am personally, I'm very amazed how very small seed fund has, has translated to different projects coming from the youth. But uh, this is a commendable step to, to an organization like ours. And I'm very glad that this approach, um, but personally, I, I'm, not, I'm not easily contented. <laughs> so uh, I want to look beyond, I want to, to dream big. And I want to genuinely and fully integrate youth in our work, in our programs. Um, because I think as, as an organization, we, we have a lot of, um, of advantage how to institutionalize uh, the youth sector in our normative work. And, and I'm aware that this is very context specific, very, we have to deal with bureaucracy and everything, but we have, this is a battle cry of many organizations before, but uh, we can, we can do it. We have, um, we have, uh, we're counting women participation, for example. So why not we're counting uh, uh, youth participation in some of the possible or appropriate programs or projects and making sure that we have certain projects that includes youth. Um, but uh, we have to break barriers. Um, institutionalizing the youth sector is not an easy task, I know. Uh, we have to have champions for this. Uh, we have to have a good um, examples on the ground. Um, because we believe that uh, when we integrate youth in our work, we address a lot of sustainability issues like what Courtney said earlier. Uh, we have, we, we, when we deal with youth, we, we deal with sustainability. And if we want to make successful in our programs, if we want to make the most out of our investment, I think um, providing, for providing enough support to youth is, is important. And also I think um, another important thing is that we are 
the, the issue of migration and refugee is always on the headlines. And also the world is clamoring for, for us to attain the sustainable development goals. But those things are all interrelated and come to think of it that the youth is always at the heart of those, um, of those um, aspects. For example, that if we, uh, we, if we provide enough opportunities for the youth in the rural areas, we can, um, we can increase empowerment, participation, and well-being for them to stay and for them to, to, to have, uh, to have, to, for them, to, for not to migrate and to move around places. Um, it can also boost rural productivity and reduce the number of young people leaving rural areas for city jobs. So a lot of, a lot of, um, issues in on the headlines today can be addressed when we address uh, when we when we target youth in our in our work um creating a, a lot of there's a, an adb report that uh, asian development back report that a third of the 169 sdg targets centers on youth or it is um it, it highlights the role of youth to achieve, to achieve those targets so i think um responsibly engaging youth in sustainable agriculture would mean would, would make us achieve the, the 2030 targets that we that we have set in the international platform thank you paula i actually have one question because you mentioned um this small seed fund that it, it really amplified into a, a great project what did that fund go towards did it go to funding the ideas that the youth came up with or just facilitating that program itself Yes, a part of that uh, seed fund provides implementation of the selected sustainable approaches, innovative approaches. So they get to implement those small projects. So, um, so it's not only to implement the program, but also to, to provide seed funds. And we ha want to see how it works. We want to see if they, they, if they grow, if they say they're going to grow, uh, crops. We want to see it, um, you know, getting harvested at some point. And also, uh, it also provides uh, learning experiences so they get to interact with other implementers through workshops. Thanks. That's commendable, especially for FAO. And I love to hear your perspective on, um, I've actually never heard that number on how many t SDG targets um, hinge on youth in, in some way. Um, Ms. Honorine, can we have your thoughts? Um, thanks again. And um, if I talk about what exactly we're doing on the ground, as uh, I and my colleagues about this mo movement of integrating the youth in these activities, I'll just give like three activities that we've done uh, very recently. And that has really um, given us a high uh, productivity. I would say that most of the time we just uh, focus on couture. I mean, uh, taking students to see different places, different bamboo, uh, to visit the bamboo, um, bamboo park, that's what we call it here. And, uh, and uh, bringing them to different parks, just making sure that they get connected to the earth, they get connected to what is around, I mean, to what we are trying to conserve and restore so that they really feel its importance. And the second thing we try to do is just the TV shows and the radio shows to make sure that um, the students and the youth is, are really linked with the policy influencers so, and policy makers so that they can give their ideas in how, uh, on how they want to make things happen. The third thing is that we just take practical activities on the ground. I mean, we do it ourselves. If it means to plant trees, we do that. And that's, you know, in, in IUC and as an organization, we try to integrate the youth. Thank you. I just, I wanted to highlight, someone had a question on um, engaging youth. So that young people can be reluctant to get engaged in forestry and agriculture more and more. And how do we make those sectors be more attractive? Um, and, and just your thought, because I've from I've heard the answer from some people that you have to start early, um, that you have people who are growing up in cities and losing their connection to nature and losing any um, desire to engage in, in that type of environment or or even understand what it's like. And 
starting with these, these tours, environmental education, I, I know that's one wave that has come about to try to bridge that, that gap. Um, Courtney, could you speak to us next? Yeah, sure. Um, so, yes, yeah, let me give a bit of an example of um, my part of one of our programs and what we do. So uh, I thought I'd just talk a little bit about our national chapters, which I think is probably the most interesting and relevant of, of, of what we do. So we have some global initiatives as well, but I think the national chapters are the most exciting. Um, I'll give a little bit of a, a description how it sort of works. So we have about um, 80 national chapters around the world. And really, the um, where we where we first start out, there's a national representative that sort of comes to us and says, hey, we're, we really want to engage with young people in the agricultural sector. I feel like it's really important. We start a dialogue with them and say, okay, can you start an activity to show that you're, you're serious about this? Um, you know, they, they start mobilizing young people on the ground and then, then they start a national chapter. It's a purely voluntary uh, role. And where we're more established, we do elections every few years to, to get the, the young youth representative. They then develop sort of a national working group and identify what they want to work on. So this is, it really ranges. It's basically what they feel is important for young people in their country based on certain objectives that YPART follows, which is sort of the attractiveness of agriculture, young people in policy discussions, capacity development of young people. And they choose sort of key things. But what's really important for YPART is really about building national groups uh, or local, because sometimes it's subnational. Um, and really having that strength at, on the ground of young people that are ready to engage, that are ready to defend young people in the agricultural sector and who are ready to mobilize. And having that youth leadership around is really the only way that I think we're gonna actually get activity um, in a lot of those countries. So those young people, if they're already engaged, if they're already working on it, they're, they're ready to get engaged in policy discussions, which there's no point in, I mean, I mean the global, the regional, yes, they have them, but I think the national, the subnational is where the activities really happen. So we're really interested in, in supporting those local led initiatives and really about supporting youth leadership. Um, and I think the really interesting stuff for all, us is also how that relates to innovation. So how does local innovation happen? And, and then doing that across, across groups. So one thing we also facilitate is sort of discussions among national reps so that they can also share with each other their, their good practices. We share different programs where the national reps then can change it locally to, to innovate it related to what's important for them. And, and to give concrete examples of that, um, we started, um, uh, YPA started doing a mentoring program, um, also through the Yale program as well, but I um, mean, uh, different types of mentoring. And then that was sort of taken on by, by lots of national representatives, but in particular, YPA Nepal and YPA Croatia, and they totally made it their own. So they basically, took something where there was a lot of thinking and research developed on how mentoring is important for young people, but then they said, but this isn't quite relevant for where I live. So in Nepal, um, it was much more online and it was much more peer-to-peer -peer based uh, with sort of key people sort of giving lectures on key things. And in Croatia, they basically found that there were a lot of older farmers within this particular area that didn't have a lot of engagement with other people. Um, they didn't talk to a lot of people during the day and there were a lot of practices that were dying out. So they basically organized for young people that were interested in farming to sit together. They'd usually sit in a park underneath a tree and they would just talk to each other. And, and that was also, you know, there was, there was good in that they learned they were able to uh, pass on some of those practices, but there was also a community good where they were getting out in the community, they were talking to people and there's a lot of added benefits to a lot of these activities as well. Um, I was actually just reading about YPAR Jamaica in our newsletter and they've gone and done all sorts of interesting things related to um, engaging with primary school students, talking about what are the possibilities in agriculture, um, to talking about testimonials, sort of who are some success stories in, in agriculture. And then they just, and this is new to me, they just created an online space called I Need Advice, where young people can pose questions and solicit feedback. Um, so again, for us, there's a lot of activities, but I think about, uh, I think at the local, at the national level, that, that's where we're really gonna see a lot of innovation uh, and a lot of change. And then, and then my very last closing one is uh, engaging with other organizations that do this. So that's where a webinar like this is quite good. And YPRD is an active member of the Youth and Landscapes Initiative, and we have been sort of since its inception. Um, and so I think this also contributes to those uh, good practices as well. Well, I love that. And um, what I'm really hearing is this notion that we have to build a community because there are so many interested and, um, you know, I think all of us have our own aspirations and ideas about how 
we want to affect positive change. Um, but it's when you get under a tree and have, start having those conversations with people that they start becoming actionable from, from your head and into the world. Um, so I think that definitely is one, one barrier, building community that, that our youth organizations are addressing. Um, there are a few others for sure that I see in the chat box. Um, one is funding, 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 but we will get to that later. Um, I think we have just a Jaguar who is left to speak. I hear some birds, which sounds really nice. Ajagwal, could you share with us yep. some best practices from CSAYN? Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, cur currently, I will share with you guys uh, three or two of our practices so far. Um, currently, at um, the um, global level, uh, my organization, although it's still underway, we are trying to develop an app, mobile app precisely, that would um, help to monitor the success of um, plants um, from the start point of the seedling down to maturity, at least um, so that we can begin to minimize losses in um, agricultural produce. Then um, also we are trying to um, build in um, capacity in terms of um, introducing um, people to to early mature, um, maturing seedlings. And that's why we are trying to launch a program currently. It's um, a rural rugged program where we have to get into the interiors, the rural areas, to meet with um, the major producers because, of course, we know the rural area, areas most times um, feed um, the, 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 the urban setting. That is where much of the agriculture sector, um, agriculture take place. So we are trying to reach out to the communities um, give, um, provide them with improved seedlings and all of that. And um, aside these um, two programs we are into currently or um, app we are trying to develop, we um, currently we've launched a program called um, the African Youth um, for Sustainable Development Go Training in um, local languages of um, the world. So what we intend doing through this program or what we are doing currently is that we um, we are able to translate the SDGs, that's the SDGs into um, the local languages of different countries or ethnic group, so it could be more inclusive. I believe um, this was um, one of the loopholes the um, MDGs had. Um, those in the rural setting were not carried along. It wasn't inclusive. So on this platform now, we are trying to translate it to the different local languages, and then we can share this idea with um, those at the rural level so that they can participate or inclusively um, be involved in the achievement of um, um, the, um, the SDGs, that's um, Division 2030. So these are just some um, three programs we are trying to implement um, currently at um, global level. Thank you. I actually don't mind the birds in the background, it's kind really nice. But Peter, if you're alive and you can mute. Yep, day. working on it. All right, perfect. Um, thank you, guys. All the participants, you've been engaging a lot in the chat box, and um, I want to dive into your questions now because this is, for me, the fun part. Um, we've talked about some great initiatives. We have organizations here that are doing great work um, to integrate youth on the ground, but we're, st we're still not there yet, right? So we're not at the place where we all feel happy, comfortable, um, even those of us who work in integrating youth, we're not at a place where we say, yeah, we're, we're, um, we're moving as fast as we want to be moving. Um, and so I think some of that can be, some of this can be captured in the conversation of the ugly. So initially I wanted it to be um, a place of common pitfalls, like what, what do we continuously get wrong maybe over and over? Or what do organizations continue to get wrong? But, um, and actually, if our speakers could jump in and also our participants, if you could just share one to two or three words of what you think um, people and organizations who integrate or try to include youth get wrong in the chat box, that would be great. And if I can hear really quickly from our, our speakers so that we can get to our questions. Um, let's start with Paula. You always surprise me. 
So I want to share this. Uh, I went on a, on a mission to the Philippines last week, and I went to a, a forest restoration site where FAO provided uh, funding to a small to a watershed management council. And I was very surprised to to observe, you know, the pressing of Imperata cylindrica, pressing so they won't they won't grow up right away. So they press it for them to find. Um, um, Regenerants for assisted natural regeneration. I'm talking a lot of forestry stuff, but basically there's a small family who was contracted by the Watershed Management Council for them to, to take care of a vast uh, land, and they they are paid for around $120 for US dollars per hectare. So the the family is composed of father, mother, and two brothers. And then I realized that. Uh, the the youth are always, you know, they are they are always in the background. When it comes to the agriculture, uh, the farming communities, the fishery communities, um, and also uh, forestry, somehow, especially in the rural areas, they are always uh, part of the activity. They are part of the production. They are part of the value chain. But when we think of um, think of agriculture, forestry, and fishery as a program, sometimes they're always in the background and we don't integrate them in, them in our planning, in our concept, in our inception at the higher level. So it's a good reminder for me um, that the, in, in small households, they do they, they, have, they have defined roles. They they contribute work if they, they are not in school. So it's 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 important for them to be integrated in, in if we design project, if we put concept notes, if we put, you know, inception of, a, of our projects. So, and I commend governments and organizations who provide spaces for youth, but I think we can go beyond from mere representation, but to see the youth as, as equal, valuable pieces of a big puzzle of a landscape. And the thing that the common, that this is part is when we talk about the common people, and I think some organi organizations just jump into the youth bandwagon, you know, just because youth is, you know, youth is in fashion. But I think we can go beyond that. We can go from just merely talking about youth because it's the in thing. We can we can integrate it and we can be genuine genuine in our in our approach for them to be, you know, to be included and to be out of the margin. Thank you, Paula. I love your perspective each time because it, it kind of takes us back to the ground and um, and into the reality of so many people that um, are at the end of the day making those actions and, and that are affecting and, and shaping those environments and landscapes. Um, Ms. Honorine, do would you like to go next? And then for all the rest of our speakers, just give me a give me a wave if you'd like to say something on this topic. All right. Um, thanks again. And then talking about what our organization is doing wrong and what ourselves we're doing wrong. Uh, let me start with what our organization is doing wrong. Uh, yesterday, I tried to post about this uh, digital summit on my different social media platforms. Uh, of course, mainly the WhatsApp thing and everything. So I asked this question, uh, what would you like uh, to have being spoken on this? I mean, why aren't we involved? What are the challenges? And one of the people um, uh, from East Africa mentioned it was like the, 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 the first problem of our organization, our government and everything is that they are mainly focused on their election. And now when they are there, they don't remember us. This was the person from East Africa. So I believe that talking about this restoration activities, we cannot do it all alone as the youth. But also, we have to uh, get um, uh, connected. We have to get um, collaborative with the government. So this is his response. He was like, our governments are only uh, mainly focused about their elections. They're only focused about the parties, their individual needs. But when they are there, they don't remember us. And even when we go to them, then there is no response from them. My second experience was when I was in Nigel for the FRL 100. 
um, I was entering in where we were residing in my hotel and I met this big gentleman and he asked me, um, what's your name and why are you here? And uh, he was like, you look like somebody's daughter. Maybe you are escorting your dad. And yet I was coming in the same meeting as his, his as, as the meeting he was coming in. So the, the, the challenges that we meet with our organization and government is that we are considered young, very young. I mean, we can't contribute anything because we are young. So that's one thing that um, our organization maybe is getting wrong. Uh, first, I mean, how is the government helping us to get into this? How is the organization helping us? If the, you know, no security, they are focused on parties, election and everything, then how are we going to get involved? So what ourselves are getting wrong is that not, not all the government are bad, not all organizations are bad. Some of the opportunities are out there, but unfortunately the youth, we rarely read, I would say. We don't read, you know, we don't follow us with opportunities that are out there for ourselves. And now we are here blaming, maybe here I'm talking too much of an African, I don't know. <laughs> and, and we are there blaming our governments, we are there blaming our organizations, but there are opportunities that are there to capture, but we don't read about them. We don't make some good research. And we are just there hashtagging about the bad, but not mainly focusing about the good. And then the second thing is that we probably, what we are getting wrong, we probably don't know how to draft out our own initiatives. If they are not, if they are not um, jobs to go for, I mean, to, if, if they are not jobs to seek, then what are we coming up with our initiatives? So I guess that is one thing that we're getting wrong. And one thing that I've been told is that, and I really found very, uh, value in it, is that um, I was asked uh, if you were the one, can you draft out a project? You know, but uh, I was like, let me throw this to you. I, I won't give you the response I give to the person who asked me this, but um, can how many youth, when they're graduating from university, can really draft out a project to present to someone? Yeah, and, and, and maybe another point that I can immediately say that we ourselves are getting wrong. Let's say we're going for a, a summit, a conference or something like that. We meet the president or somebody of a high level, I mean, you know, someone on, on a high level. Um, yeah, and you will mainly see that the youth will mainly focus on taking the selfies, but few of them will ask for a business card, which is a very big issue. So if we can't remember the business card and we remember the selfies, then you see what we value the, the most. So maybe that's what I can contribute to what our gun yes, it is getting wrong and ourselves are getting wrong. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. You've, you've touched on so many great points that are relevant. Um, and I wouldn't say not just to African youth, but um, to so many of us in the world. Um, and, and I see some people in the chat box as well who are, coming along with this message of why are we asking always for, why are we looking towards these organizations to integrate youth? What can we do as young people to coordinate ourselves? Um, because we are the creative ones, you know, we all, we have these skills, these energies, why can we, we do this on our own? Um, and I think that that's something that in, in, in every conversation, you have these two groups of people, one who say, we need this, and then there's the we need to be coordinated. Um, and I think both have to happen at the same time. And we need to be smart enough, present enough, active enough, you know, read enough to be ready when it comes. Because if you look at um, opportunities, there are a lot of opportunities that, that are given to youth and that maybe enough people don't apply for. So if you look at Daniel and I, an EFI's new project. Um, I wonder how many applications they have now, but there are oftentimes a lack of interest, a lack of um, qualified, passionate um, young people for these opportunities. And so it really touches on um, an aspect of capacity building as well, because we can expect graduates who aren't being trained well to be able to do a project. Um, you know, and if you haven't had some training on networking, maybe you don't know how to ask for that business card. Or, um, you're not at the space where you can take your ideas from idea to um, to a business. 
So I also think that that's a key role that our youth organizations play is filling that gap and not waiting for a government to change um, the educational curricula for those things to be included because we don't type of time for sure. Um, but can we go to Courtney? I think you haven't said anything yet on this topic. No, thanks. And yeah, honoring definitely that's something we see. So a lot of people get really excited and they want to do something and then they're just like, but what should I do? And, and I think that's totally natural. I mean, just, you know, you, you want to do something, but you don't know exactly what it is. And that's where I think the youth organizations do come in at least providing some sort of a, a guideline, but there is more need of capacity development. And like you guys said, there's a lot of opportunities out there and some people are really good at getting those opportunities and will get a lot of them. And, you know, they say they're professional, they're, they're the professional, uh, you know, people who apply for things and then, and then they get it. So I completely agree with that. Um, my, 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 I'll just say two points of what I thought the common pitfalls are. And the first, um, which drives me crazy, is uh, that young people are not a homogenous group. And people talk about the youth as a big group of people that all want the same thing and have the same experience. And that's just simply not true. I mean, a young woman in a rural area in India has very little in common with a young um, man in Mexico City who's got, you know, a job and a university degree. They're just simply completely different people. And so we cannot... Uh, deal with the, the youth issue. It, you know, there is no youth issue. There's a lot of different people with different experiences and that needs to be addressed differently. The, what's my second thing is, um, I, I think currently a lot of the problems going on right now is people looking at the large youth unemployment issue, which is a big concern, and saying that entrepreneurship is going to be, is going to solve that. And, and I think that's just really very unrealistic. Um, for a lot of reasons. One is just the way that agriculture is moving um, as, as an industry, but also just not all young people are entrepreneurs. It's a very certain specific type of group and not all young people are going to do that. And for the ones that will, absolutely fine, support them in what they're going to do. But there is a whole other spectrum of, of other young people. And so I think we need to stop thinking of entrepreneurship as this magic bullet uh, for youth unemployment. Solid, thank you. Um, have I heard from Ejegwo? Not to you. Hello? Yeah, we can hear you. Hello? I can hear you. Yeah. For me, I think from a practical angle, yeah, a practical angle, um, I think one major pitfall is for the fact that, um, we have a lot of graduates that um, are agriculturists that um, studied something relating to agri-economics. Um, but um, unfortunately, you find that even these people, supposedly, sh that should have been involved in um, um, the agriculture sector, all of them still wants to go for the white-collar job. And I feel it's um, a major problem, and we can't really achieve a lot if um, the youths that even study these courses don't even put this into practice. Then um, a major pitfall also, I think, for the fact that um, people are not able to translate as youths, we are not able to translate our ideas from, um, from, from the paper down to the field. So I think if um, our organizations are able to, you know, strategically um, come up with plans um, to translate these ideas that people come up with from the, 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 the pen aspect down to um, the feed aspect, I think it's going to go a long way in helping youths um, to become economically empowered because every youth wants to be economically empowered and um, the only way for this to happen is to move from the standpoint of just beneficiaries down to um, producers, that from the point of um, not just being observers and um, seeking for help dependence to the point whereby others, the aged, can really depend on us. So, I feel these two points are really a major concern and pitfall. Like I said, being able to translate the ideas from the um, pen, from the book, down to the field. Then um, if youths who are um, engaged in, uh, who studied um, um, courses relating to agriculture are able to move from the educational setting down to the field, then um, we, we can really achieve a lot when we talk about um, um, feeding the world by um, 2030 or 2050. In this way, a lot will be achieved. Thank you. 
there's so much in this topic and and this was the the risk when developing this digital summit um, and, and this is the first one with the with the youth um, focus it was you know do we jump into rural youth migration do we jump into mainstreaming youth into agriculture what do we do and I think um, I'm really grateful and thankful that all of you came on for such a general conversation um, and that people are are listening and engaging in this because it's going to inform the next series of of digital summits that we're running next year. Um, um, and, and who knows, this is the input that you guys give will inform what happens next year. So who knows, we might have a, a grant writing digital summit coming up next. Um, Daniel, I think you're the last one. Yes, well, um, okay, so I think one big problem is that the youth, we, we lack credibility and times are tough. When you apply for a job somewhere, it's very likely that there is someone who's more experienced than you who's also out looking for a job. And that's more attractive to any organization. They don't have to train you. You know, they're not worried about that. It's, yeah, it's quite, it's quite difficult. Um, but one thing that I would mention, um, since we're talking about pitfalls, what we are struggling with at the moment with this new initiative is actually communication to get the word out because when you establish something like this we have existing communication channels but we are targeting a very specific group so we can't exactly use IFSA because we're not targeting students and if we use our directors I mean they're too senior for this so that's it's it's quite a challenge to get to these to these younger researchers, you know, but you, someone asked about, or you asked about the amount of applications we've received. We've received a whole lot of interest, um, but the application procedure is, is quite tough and we have it like that so that we can sort of weed out the ones who are not too dedicated. Um, we have agreed that we will extend the application date which was the 31st of December, because we only launched it at, in Freiburg in Germany in September. And yeah, it is a bit, I think it would be a bit tricky to build an application for this thing by the end of December. So we will extend to until the end of February. But otherwise, yeah, the communication is, I, I, I get emails from, from students trying to take a chance even, and I think that also says something, but yeah, communication. Hey, that's yeah. everything. And yeah, that's... go on. Well, if if I ever see either of you, then I would definitely take a selfie and take your business cards. <laughs> At least someone's someone's got it right. And I, I thank you, Miss Honorine, for mentioning that. I think everyone's gonna think twice before they take a selfie from now on. All right, um, if everyone from my speakers have said their bit on pitfalls, I want to dive into these questions because they're quite exciting. Um, and I think the first one I want to go into, um, someone asked, how do we define youth? That's just an easy one, so I'm gonna hop in. Uh, oftentimes I hear it at 18 to 35, but I think we definitely fit those who are under 18 as well. Um, it just tends not to be a target audience for um, most organizations. The second one is really about this youth-led initiative. How do we connect youth organizations? How do we jump across sectors? And th that's why I wanted to bring up the Youth and Landscapes Initiative, because it, it's, it began as this initiative to bridge the gap between youth organizations, forestry, agriculture, geography, whatever, as well as interested individuals and young professionals um, and students who weren't tapped into this youth organizations. So really being a, a community of young people who want to affect positive change and bridging those gaps. And a large part of where we've worked in the past has been in capacity building, um, in doing some of these trainings on how to engage in conferences, how to network, how to pitch. Um, I was involved in Paris 
with um, a program that had us together for a week. Um, we were paired with a mentor and she was a C4 scientist. We were given a problem. Um, 10 of us from around the world never met each other before um, and asked to come up with a solution to um, actually global land tenure um, the mapping, which is a big question, and then pitch it to you know the director of the World Bank and, and all of these individuals. And that was probably the most, one of the most stressful things I had um, participated in. Frustrating. Um, but at the end of the day, after hours and hours of being in that group with 10 people, we came up, we learned I think I dropped out for a second. Am I back? Yeah. Oh, my, my point was that I think we should have a platform for connecting people. And I think that is what the GLF now is and is going to be for the next four years, is bringing people together, um, having these conversations. And I really want you all to stay connected um, as we move forward. So I'm gonna jump into a question. Funding, funding, funding. Youth have skills, youth have ideas, youth are leaders. How do we harness these to receive funds? Because often the biggest barriers for youth are lack of funds for students trying to study and work. Wave your hand, speaker. Okay, Courtney. Okay, I don't have the answer, but, um, but what I'm just gonna see, some of the really interesting and innovative responses that we've seen in our network, because we have very little funds ourselves, um, is that they, they really just go to people they know. They like knock up at the government office and like, I mean, I'm thinking of like, yeah, the Croatian entry program there, you know, the government just saying, hey, this is something, this is a really exciting initiative. This is what we want to do. They, they really use their network and it isn't always about money. It's like, do you have a room we could use? Or, you know, um, could we go to your restaurant and, and run this, run this activity, this like cooking thing that we do together or networking events. Hey, look, we'll bring all these people to your, to your, um, you know, your restaurant, and and then maybe they'll buy drinks from you, and we're going to have a networking event. So, I think there's just it's just really about trying to be creative because it's really challenging in this day and age to try to get that money, and also for youth organizations, frankly, there's just not a lot of money um, um, that people are willing to give for for things that they don't quite know if it works yet. Let's say so. I say it's about being innovative. First, you prove yourself. Once you've proven yourself and you've started to do something, a lot more people will come on board after that. Any other speakers with comments on funding? Paula? I just want to, to back on, on the Courtney's and Daniel's answer to establish the credibility. I think once, once an organization established a, a, a credibility, it's not hard to, to pitch and also to, 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 to uh, provide, uh, to, to solicit support from, from governments and organizations. So credibility is a key to an organization if they want to, to get supported uh, by, by organization. Thank you. Um, the next question we got is, can we just expect the right to participate in these processes? Oh, Ms. Honorine, I see you. Thanks for waving. Okay. Thank you. I, that's one thing that I would like to mention about finance and everything. Um, I, I understand that any, anything that involves money, of, of course, it, it comes up um, with conflicts and everything. But I also believe that anything that is good, it, it sells itself. You know, it's a matter of how do you draft out your project and uh, how do you interpret it? How do you express it? not like asking for sponsorship, but as a business deal. The problem with us is that we mostly look for sponsorship, but how can it be a business deal? I mean, are you, what are the benefits? Is the organization that is willing to sponsor, is it going to benefit from that? 
And um, yeah, everything, the, the, the good thing always sells itself. That's one thing I would love to do. And also having all the information, you know, I, I believe that in every country, there are more than 10 um, uh, financial institutions, I would say. So if one institution is, is refuting your idea, not all this 10 institution is going to refute it. One might get interested in it depending on how you expressed it and how it is well written and, and combined together. So that's one thing that I need to, I, I thought uh, could be highlighted. Thank you. Yeah, Paula. Sorry, just to add on the funding, because I know it's a big issue. But I want to share my experience. I just want to put my former IPSA hat. Because in IPSA, it's not also easy to ask funds from, from, from organizations because, you know, uh, they, they, there's still that stigma that youth cannot, you know, cannot lead, cannot organize, but, or they cannot handle finance as well. So, so what we do is to find, find champions like organizations who can vouch for us for, for them to, to, to facilitate all the, all the, the administrative and financial, financial liquidation. So if it's all about partnership. So if, if you are not um, eligible because of bureaucratic reasons, you find partners that, that can vouch for you and for them to, to, to help you in terms of, 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 of the policies and also the administrative matters. So it's, I think, um, in, in landscapes, it's all about partnership and coordination up, across sectors. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, I don't know if I'm cutting out, but I'll keep talking. Uh, putting my IFSA hat on, you've inspired me. Um, I, it's unbelievable. You can talk about IFSA and IU for being great partners. But this year, we've seen just that, that endorsement, that partnership accelerates so we can build a new partnership with EFI or deepen our, our partnership with FAO. So it, it really does, it takes like what um, Oase was saying, you know, you have to contact 20 people and if you get one response back, you, you have to have that mindset. You can't go in and, and contact two and say, oh, I didn't get it. Um, I remember that's what our university professors told us about getting research internships. You really have to um, have that drive in moving forward. And then once you have that one person who who um, is gonna bring you in, it makes it a lot easier moving forward. Um, and I wanted to talk about bridging this gap. Sometimes it's it's about not getting the right people in the room at the right time. And um, at the GLF, we're hosting a youth session and it's called Drawing Landscapes. And we're making the effort to target our invitations to organizations, to people and organizations who've expressed interest in, in connecting with youth in some way. So we're, we're going to have the IUCN, FAO, UN environment, and have this as a space. Am I cutting out people? No. Okay, I'm good. No, um, perfect. Thank you. Um, but we've called it Drawing Landscapes because we're putting people in groups. We want them to have discussion, and we're going to draw and vision and discuss our way forward um, together. So I invite those who are going to be at GLF to jump in. Um, I think it will also be live streamed. So there'll be some way for you to also engage online. Funding, funding, funding. Have we all felt comfortable enough to move on? No, Daniel. Okay, I'll tell you guys something that I think Selena has heard before. So the UFRA president, Michael Wingfield, he has a nice little tip that he usually tells us about when it comes to funding. So he says, if you, ask someone for funding from zero, then the chances that you're going to get anything are highly unlikely. What he says is that you should say, look, I got $100. Would you be willing to match that? And usually that gets you a bit further. And in addition to that, you, you can offer something in return, say a report, say you want to go somewhere, you want to go to a conference, I'll take notes, I'll write a report, uh, you have to offer something in return and slowly but surely with that method you can build up you you can build up enough money to do what you want to do and I can tell you that it's worked for me and yeah when whenever 
or Mike speaks at a IFSA symposium, he always tells everyone this. And I'm not sure if people implement it, but it's really a worthy thing. Even if you lie in the beginning and say, oh, I got a thousand dollars already from this guy, would you be willing to match that? And that's, that's a good start. Thanks, Daniel. Somehow I haven't heard that one before. And that's cost me money in the past, so I've got to jump on that one. <laughs> um, we are wrapping, we're getting close to our, our time. Um, I think we're getting kicked out at 2.30. So I'd like our speakers to share with us their thoughts about the way forward. Um, <laughs> love it, lie your way to the top, we'll keep this quote. Um, that's the key message from Daniel. <laughs> I think um, Sabina dropped out uh, for just a moment. Um, uh, Courtney, why don't you take it over and um, give the lessons learned and uh, wrap up messages uh, to youth? Go ahead, uh, Courtney. Um, sure. Um, well, uh, I guess it, it, my my sort of take forward uh, message, I think, from this is, uh, I think probably one organization just can't do it alone. Um, oh, there's Elena, she's back. Um, but anyway, I'll just give my, my quick points. Um, so yeah, one organization can't do it alone and actually not even youth organizations can do it alone. So it's a really, really big multi-disciplinary, um, uh, multi-individual um, sort of issue. And so I think when we're talking about engaging with youth, that a lot of people, a lot more players need to get involved. And this is starting. I mean, I, it, it, it has changed in the last few years, definitely the landscape. So I think we can probably start to have a bit more serious conversations with this sort of thing. So um, yeah, um, a little bit more youth-focused research. We, we've been doing some youth aspirations research, which has been super interesting. Um, and engagement with um, players in education and rural development and the banking sector. And it, it's a big conversation that needs to be had. Thanks, Courtney. Um, I don't know how much uh, of what I said you guys heard, but the point was really that I think we're at a critical stage where we're able to have these conversations on a larger stage. If you look at the GLF, um, we used to struggle to get youth on the stage for a plenary, and this year we're having one in every plenary session. So we're seeing the progress forward. There's a demand for inclusivity in, of indigenous groups, of women, of, of youth. So I really would like to know for those of you who are paving the way forward, who've been involved for a while and are, are seeing their future ahead to continue doing this work. Um, how do you see the future? What do you think needs to happen? What, um, what steps do we need to take? So thank you, Courtney, for starting. Um, Ejegwo, could we have you go second? Yeah, the future is very bright for the youths at large. Um, that's only if we do what we ought to do as youths as youth and um, um, put in much energy. Um, that's why I want to say a big thank you to Global Landscape Forum, at least for trying to assemble youths from different angles of the continent to um, share information and ideas. So we would need more of a um, peer group organization to, to do such um, activities. Um, we like the words of one of my mentor he said what we can do to achieve a better world is what we call peer group advocacy so if we can adopt that method i think we would achieve a lot in the nearest future considering the fact that um, the youths will be more inclined to um hearing the success story from um, a fellow youth than um, from the aged then also i think um the future would also only be bright if um at national level and um regional or state level we can begin to have um, what we call uh, um, 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 youth councils that will be headed by the youths um, to look into matters um, relating to the youths. So I think with this two um, approach, we can um, achieve what we want to achieve as youths and um, for a better world. Thank you. Um, Daniel. Right, well, I think that we should just continue with what we're doing from my end, at least, um, with this Young Scientist Initiative. We have another similar initiative 
in the pipeline, although that's all I can say for now. We definitely plan on expanding this. So from 2018, we're only accommodating, or we're only offering five grants for 2018, but 2019, we've got quite a lot of interest for funders. So we'll most likely be able to bump it up to 15 grants and we want to keep that going every year, add another 10, maybe more, depends on the interest. Um, so that's what we want to, that's what we want to stick with. And we'll keep you guys informed when we decide on our new initiative. If so, we'll be the first to know. And yes, we'll, pla we'll, we'll learn a lot from this coming round of recruits for our initiative. And there'll be a lot of publicity around it. So you can learn about them. You can speak to them about their experiences. And that's what we plan on doing, at least for the next year. Thank you. Paula? I think you're muted, but passionate. I can see it. Yeah, I got, got so excited. But um, what I wanted to say is that um, what we are benefiting now from the long struggle of people who have rallied behind on including, including you. This has been, for decades, been a, been a battle cry of a lot of organization for you to be included. And we are benefiting that increasing recognition. But this is just the first step. The recognition is just, just the first step. So um, there should we should not be contented with this. But again, we should clamor for investment. We should clamor for more um, attention and highlight our role. Uh, for this, I think um, from, the, from the conversation uh, earlier is that um, a lot of fundamental issues are actually um, are, are needed for us to be integrated well because of, of education, a lot of out of school youth, a lot of issues in terms of privatization, tuition fees, and also unemployment rate are increasing. These are fundamental issues that need to be addressed by societies, I guess, for us to be, for, for, for us to answer the question how to be, for us to be, how to be included. And also, sorry, I, I feel like we're running a lot of time, so I feel like uh, I need to slow down. Okay, sorry. <laughs> okay, and lastly, I want to share this a little bit, uh, a little bit of a story of a workshop hosted by FAO, which aims to to put the silverbacks in the international development work in forestry, and a lot of of, of silverbacks in forestry programs, and also the young people. We have we have five young uh, people there who sat with silverbacks to have a meaningful conversation and to share what are the what are the uh, stories behind their pitfalls and also their successes before. And one thing I, I've, I've gained uh, from from that workshop workshop is that. Um, there is power in numbers. If we keep on saying that we are the chunk of the population, there is power in numbers. So we can turn the wheel around for us not to be the, the marginalized one. For us, uh, for us to do this, continue mobilizing and organizing like what YPART has, has, uh, has been doing and also IFSA, continue mobilizing and organizing and continue partnering with, with, with different sectors for us to, to have a more meaningful engagement in, in natural resources management. Um, I think that's it. Thank you. Um, lastly, Ms. Honorine. All right, thanks again. And um, well, my last statement, I would say that uh, I would not say that the future is bright. I would not say that the future is bright, but I would say that the future is us by us for others. So um, if the future is us, then uh, it doesn't mean it's bright. It might be bright or ugly. So it depends on how do we verify ourselves? How do we look like? Are we bright or are we ugly? So I'm not addressing this to the speakers who are present here, but also to the participants, uh, who are following us and even the, to the people we find it online even after some good some good time so if the future then is not bright but it is us are we bright or ugly then that determines how we're gonna live um in the in the days to come and uh of course if we want to change the way we look like the way we act like and the way we speak out then we will have to improve ourselves yeah, to improve the way we see things, to improve the way we act on things and we do things. 
if we see things in the perspective of the government and our organization and everything, that could not change anything. But how do we come up with our cells, uh, with our good cells, uh, to to change things? And um, yeah, we all we have rights and responsibilities to speak out and to blame A, B, C, D. My last post on Instagram, I actually said that I'm so tired of summits and conferences and meetings and everything because we find most of the time we are addressing the same issue, talking about A, B, C, D, the same things that we addressed in the last meeting. So now, what are the steps that we take uh, to change those things? And from the five years that has been spoken, what have we done so far? I believe that um, if we take a good practical step to change things that we have been addressing for the past years, then we're gonna make a big change. And uh, you know, believing that the responsibility is, is us, you know, the responsibility is ours, not somebody's. And then we're gonna change something. Let's. Uh, my last post on Instagram, I said that when we do the right thing and on the right time, we start small and do and 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 let it grow big. Then the government, the organizations, they will adjust. They will see that we need uh, to be included in their programs. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think we've heard from all of our speakers. Do let me know if we haven't. No, we have. Um, and we've heard a lot from our participants. Thank you for all of your comments, your um, suggestions in the chat box. We're gonna go through this and make sure that we address them um, sometime in our, in our GLF strategy that we're gonna come up with in our future engagements with youth um, and throughout the GLF as a whole. We're at a point right now where we are surveying all of our stakeholders so that we can jointly shape what the GLF is for the next four years. So um, we'll definitely send out that survey. It's coming out today to all of you because it's important that we feel like we're taking ownership over this, this platform. This is not something that we want to be a top-down um, initiative that we're, we're saying, oh, we're bringing communities together, but people don't feel like they're part of this community. So I would really encourage you all to take this opportunity um, to feel vested and, and to give your direction, um, your guidance on how you want the direction to go moving forward. Um, and I have some exciting kind of vision for some, some news on how the GLF is going to work moving forward when it, with respect to youth. So we are committed to building um, a youth-led initiative through the Youth and Landscapes Initiative. Um, and this is for everyone to join in, for everyone to shape, um, and for youth to have the say in what programs will be developed and how we'll, we'll do it. And then we're also, we're also going to work a lot on the subnational and national level and having national youth meetings. So um, I think there's a lot to look forward to with respect to the GLF, but there's also a lot more to look forward to with respect to our generation. And the fact that we're having this conversation with over 50 people is excellent. So I want to thank you all for participating. Thank you for your energy, your questions, your contributions. Um, thanks to my wonderful speakers. I really appreciated having this conversation with all of you from around the world. Um, and that's it for now. Um, I will see some of you in Bonn next week and those who will not be there, you can join in online. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you, Selina. And thank you all for uh, joining us today in our digital summit. Uh, thanks for your engagement and thank you to our speakers and moderators. As uh, promised, we will distribute the link to the recording to you all and we'll follow up on any questions um, which you might have forwarded and were left unanswered during today's digital summit. Uh, we will also keep you informed of our upcoming digital summits and we'll have quite a, a few uh, prepared right now for the next uh, year. But at this moment, I wish you well. I hope to see uh, you all in the next uh, GLF digital summits. And for those of you joining us in Bonn uh, next uh, week, I hope to uh, meet you all. Thank you, Selina. Thank you, Khalid, uh, behind the scenes. And thank you to all the speakers. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.